Today is Thursday, May 22nd of 2024. This is Maria Juan Guevara speaking from Belrose, Louisiana at Mr. Arthur Ford residence who was born at Atlanta, Georgia back on August 22nd of 1947, but raised in New Orleans where he joined the army. And I would like to thank you, Mr. Arthur, for having us today and allowing us in your residence. So to begin with, I would like you to share with us a little bit more about your background, on how you joined the army, what made you join the army, and that good stuff. I graduated from high school in 1965 mm -hmm. down in New Orleans at De La Salle. And afterwards, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. I went to work at J.C. Penney's for a while, and back then the draft was going on. And I think the draft was catching up to me pretty quickly. And I decided I wanted to join so I could choose what I did. And in 1966, I joined the Army. It was late June. I signed up for the Arabic Iraqi language course. Didn't know where that was at the time, but it turned out an awfully good assignment. I went off to basic training the weekend of July 4th, 1966 finished in September and went out to the Presidio of Monterey, California and took an Arabic Iraqi course for a full year. I was doing some other training with the Army Security Agency and ended up getting orders to Vietnam, which kind of blew my mind. This was in late 67 and I headed off and got there in January of 68. And when I got there, I just knew for sure the Army was going to say, this is a mistake, you can go home. And when they asked me what my job was, I told them I was an interpreter translator. They said, great, you can work at MACV headquarters, Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. I said, well, I can, but do you have a lot of Arabs there? And they said, what do you mean? I said, that's my language. And, well, we can't use you there. I said, good, you'll send me home. And they not, no. And I got assigned to, of all places, the U.S. Army Mortuary. I didn't have a clue what a mortuary was. If you told me funeral home, I'd have caught on. But I got assigned to the morgue, went out there, and my first reaction was, oh, my God, what have I gotten into? Uh, I got in country literally a week before the Tet Offensive of 1968 started. And I got to morgue. There was 25 or 30 people there total. And they were processing one to 400 people a day through there. And I had no clue as to what to do with on that end, of the technical end. So they just used me as a warm body moving dead bodies. I learned the, you know, how they cleaned them up, how they ID'd them, how they did fingerprints. I didn't do dental charts. You had to be a dental tech to do those. But I went through the entire thing, and I probably lost 20 pounds in the first week because I couldn't keep any food down. It was an absolute terror. After a couple of weeks, they shipped me from the actual mortuary working with the bodies to a small camp just outside of Thompson Wood Air Base, which was called Camp Red Ball, and that's where we handled the personal effects of deceased GIs. Uh, after a few weeks there, I just thought it was a lot easier dealing with the bodies. You didn't have the emotional stuff. When you went through a guy's personal stuff to send home to his either his wife or his mom, dad, or whomever, that was tough. You, you learned so much about him individually that that just tore me up. I was, let me go back. The body I can deal with after a bit. My reaction beyond just the job was Vietnam. And I, and I, I don't ever want to disparage anybody's home. That place stunk. It was horrible. And now I'm sure a good bit of that was because I worked at the morgue. But part of it was just the countryside. Uh, it was rank. It took six months for me to get used to just the day in, day out grind. 
I remember one question in the list you submitted to me was uh, talking about President Kennedy and President Johnson. Mm -hmm. Kennedy was dead for several years before I went to Vietnam. I remember his death. I remember, you know, the, the funeral and all that. But Lyndon Johnson to me was, was I got to be clean with this. I will never forgive that man. Not for sending me to Vietnam. I had no problem with that. But on March the 31st, 1968, I'd been in country a little over two months. And I was sitting in a bunker line at Camp Red Gull under a mortar attack. And he made the announcement to the world that he wasn't going to run for president. That's fine with me. But that he was ceasing the bombing of North Vietnam in the interests of peace. I said, well, you forgot to tell those other guys about peace because they're blasting us right now. And he just, as far as I was concerned, he could go away and never miss him. I, I remember just being shocked that my commander in chief could do that and pull the rug out from under. Probably at that time in Vietnam, there were about probably 375, 400,000 Americans. In the next few months, it jumped to almost 500,000. But that was just a dagger to me that he would dare pull that. And I guess particularly because I was getting a mortar attack and figuring we we're going to get ground, but we didn't. We just mortars. And I spent the rest of that tour in Vietnam just furious at the guy who sent me there. Now I realized he didn't pick my name out of a hat and say go, but he was responsible for it. I think that over the years, I got past that until the last five or six years, listening to the stories from the troops that were in Iraq and Afghanistan coming back. And those guys were experiencing the same thing. The American government pulled the rug out from under them and let them hang out to dry. And that's just tough to follow with those young men and those young women coming back from those two places. I don't know, I just, it's, it's tough to handle. I, these are getting jumbled in my mind, but I know one of the questions was, did I support the war before I went? Yes, I did. I supported the war the entire time. Looking back, I supported the war. I'm not sure that I agreed with how we turned it over to politicians who didn't know squat about the war. But that wasn't my call. I know that when I got back, I was stunned at how many people in America were anti-war. <clears throat> Over there, you heard about it. You, you, it was secondhand news. But it was just stunning that that many people, when we arrived, uh, back home after the first tour. We went through the process in the Oakland Army Terminal and then went to San Francisco International for flights back. And there were people there just screaming at us, like, what did you come home for, baby killer? And of course, being young and dumb, we just, well, well ran out of people to kill, so we'll kill you. Oh, that didn't go over well at all. <laughs> but uh, we got in, quite a fight with a group of them, and it was kind of interesting because there were three or four of us in the army, and we were had about all we could handle with the folks, and all of a sudden, a group of Marines showed up, and the tide turned. <laughs> uh, I thought we were going to be arrested. Uh, the cops came, gathered us all up, and then turned us loose and said, go home. <laughs> so that was pretty neat. Uh, I went back to Vietnam, ended up in the exact same job, so I spent a total of three years in Vietnam. And uh, looking back, there were parts of that that was just emotionally horrible. The way the GIs died there was just... I, I know I couldn't handle the day-in, day-out life of a, an infantryman in Vietnam. There was no way. I had enough nonsense going out to on search and recovery operations looking for those that their unit couldn't get hold of. And 
reading the scenarios of their death was just absolutely mind boggling. Uh, I knew that they were, for the most part, they were my age or younger. When I got to Vietnam, I was 20. I experienced my 21st, 22nd, and 23rd birthday there. Uh, and most of those were, like I said, younger than I was. Every now and then you'd, you'd bump into an older one, but that was generally an accidental. Uh, I found, and you had to laugh at times because you couldn't cry. Some of the ways GIs found to die there. Uh, you know, uh, two guys got drunk one time and had a bet on how many frogs they could eat. Well, they were poison toads and they died, both of them. <laughs> and I'm, really? This is how you decided? <laughs> Um, we had one who was, he died of a heart attack and went to the, ended up, he was an uh, Oriental American and he went to the wrong morgue. They sent him to the Korean morgue in Cambron Bay and the Koreans would cremate every remains. Well, when the Koreans realized he was an American, they shipped his cremated remains to us. I was like, oh, this is going to work real well, sending him, hey, your husband died of a heart attack and he's ashes? Well, they went to notify the next to Ken he had been divorced from his wife who had, didn't want anything to do with him. He had been, I think, illegally dispossessed by his parents. They didn't want anything to do with him. So buried him in Arlington National Cemetery very quietly. I'm thinking, somebody could have made a small fortune off of that. <laughs> but um, we had one, a Marine on guard duty up in i or, or the Highlands, I forgot which. They went to exchange guard, he wasn't there. Well, they found him later. A cat of some sort had attacked him, killed him, and pretty much mangled him. Apparently didn't like him, but didn't eat him. But it was just stunning, those. Um, probably the absolute worst one I dealt with was in Christmas of 1971. I was getting ready to come home. And uh, there was a plane crash near Cameron Bay. And it was a plane that was carrying a Vietnamese infantry company. And the Vietnamese, when they traveled, they generally, when they changed the location, they take their families with them. So they had a large number of wives and kids on that plane, and obviously everyone died. It was on a mountainside and the recovery operation took quite a long time. They, the crash was sometime after Thanksgiving, don't remember exactly, and they found him like December 22nd or 23rd and started evacuating him. Well, by the status of forces agreement, the U.S. Army processed him because there were four Americans on the plane. We got all the bodies in and we knew just by the size of the body bags that there were 20 to 30 children. And the very first bag that a friend of mine opened was an infant that was probably less than two years old. And I won't quote his exact words, but it was, well, Merry Blanken Christmas, look at this. and. The bodies had been there for 30 days, so there wasn't much to look at. It was a mess. And this had to be December 23rd or 24th. And to see that infant and then go through the number of wives and kids that died in that thing was horrible. The biggest problem, technically, two of the American crew on that were Asian Americans. And to distinguish, you know, if they were all either white Americans, black Americans, it'd be pretty easy to distinguish the flight crew from the other, but they weren't. And it took forever to sort out who was who in there. Finally did, and the last one was positively identified the day before I left to come home the last time. Uh, Vietnam, left a scar on me that I think I've for the most part gotten over. Uh, my wife tells me that periodically at night I'm 
toss and turn. That could have been bad pizza. It could have been bad dreams. I know I, I occasionally get dreams. I tend to get them more when on the news there's some story of Afghanistan or Iraq. It just probably gets to me. I'm not sure where you want to take this after that, and I don't know if that's enough background to hand it over to you for questions or what you're after. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, okay. One of the questions that we have, so I know you mentioned about your wife. Were you married when you left work? Or? No, I was single. I didn't get, I came back in, let's say it was December of 71. I went to field artillery officer candidate school, graduated in, July of 72, was assigned to Fort Polk and met my future wife there. We got married in December of 72. Mm -hmm. uh, she passed away in 1997 from cancer, but uh, we've had, I had three daughters with her and uh, you know Kate, the young, she's the youngest. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, she never got to see the grandkids. She didn't see Kate graduate from high school. But the older two, she saw high school and that. But um, no, I was single when I went, single when I came back. And all I can say on that is, thank goodness. I, I don't know how guys were married, had families dealt with that. Okay, so before you left um, to the ward, where were you staying or residing at the time? Were you living at Fourport or? Was I living what? Yeah, where were you living? Like, were you living at, I know you shared with me that you were at New Orleans or there, was, so would, do you still my, there? My family was in New Orleans. Okay. I, I came through there uh, just to visit them before I left. Mm -hmm. um, I had, one of my assignments was the security engine in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. I don't want to go into that, but I went from Belvoir home on leave to Vietnam. Okay. And so it was my mom, dad, I have three sisters and one brother. All of them were in New Orleans at the time. Okay, so back then, do you have any like friends, relatives, or anyone that you know going to the war as well as you did or the friends that i served with there and i'll be honest with you i've lost track of just about all of them every now and then amazingly enough on facebook one pops up huh? i know him um the the family no uh the people in my family on both sides that are roughly my age i don't recall any of them ever being in the military most of them were smart enough to go to college and avoid it Okay. And um, back then, did you have any hobbies or anything in particular? Or? My biggest deal was I, I followed sports and mm -hmm. sports statistics. But no, I, a hobby, I've never had hobbies in my life. And I don't know why, but no. Okay. Where I received my training. Uh, mm -hmm. Basic training was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Okay. And then the Arab language court. I told you it was at the Presidio of Monterey, Monterey, California. Mm -hmm. You talk about it, a contrast. Fort Jackson, South Carolina, we were in World War II barracks, wooden structures that were absolutely horrible. I got out to the Presidio of Monterey, they were the same barracks, but the atmosphere was absolutely totally different. It was like a, a college campus out there. Yes, you're in the military, we had all the branches there studying uh, in my class, there was Marines, sailors, Army, and I believe we had one airman. Uh, the faculty was absolutely delightful. They were, there was a husband and wife team from Baghdad, Iraq, mm -hmm. and there were several single individuals from all over Iraq. Mm -hmm. And they were our instructors. The, it was a one-year course. The first month was a mix of English and Arabic. After that, it was hit the pause button because we had to go straight Arabic. Okay. Are they coming in? Or? No. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I'll let you tell me stuff. Mm -hmm. The um, it it was uh, it was a neat time. Monterey was a beautiful community. 
Uh, we went to our instructor's home several times for Arabic food. And it, it's not exactly like the local Lebanese restaurants, but it was close. Uh, a lot of the food, I remember, yeah, we had that. Uh, Monterey itself was an awesome place to be. Uh, and the, the, the cannery at my, Cannery Row was a group of old warehouses, but restaurants and stuff. The food actually rivaled Louisiana for cooking. It was awesome. My biggest problem was I was a GI. Uh, I don't think people believed me when I got my pay was $96 a month. Wow. <laughs> and so I didn't leave a lot of room to go out and eat. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember taking trips to San Francisco just to be able to go to San Francisco. Uh, I stayed at a hotel called the Hotel Henry for $1.25 a night. Okay. You know, pretty much a dive, but it was nice. Okay. Uh, and I got to see that part of uh, San Francisco. Uh, I see pictures of San Francisco today and I don't recognize any of that. It looked like it's really going to heck in a handbasket. But I got to do that. And those things that I'd, I never had shot without being in the Army. I don't know more been to California than fly to the moon. The only other time I've been back to California was at the end of my time in the military. I was in the Louisiana National Guard and we went to Fort Irwin, California in the Mojave Desert for desert training. And that was the closest I got to San Francisco again. It was neat. Uh, so the training was, a lot of people thought it was awfully tough. It was from the idea that they're, they write from right to left as opposed to left to right. Mm -hmm. Their alphabet is nowhere near like ours. It, matter of fact, when I first saw it, I thought somebody, I said, my chicken scratch will work fine. It looks just like it. But, but uh, that was basically it. I received no further training. My job training in Vietnam was on the job. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. And uh, that was it. Okay. So when do you, because I know you were drafted to go to Vietnam, correct? No, I, I enlisted to avoid being drafted. Okay. So you enlisted yeah. to avoid. Because my okay. thought was if I got drafted, I was going to go infantry. And I was trying to avoid that. I was re not real excited about going out into the jungle day in and day out. Okay. Do you have... um? Any uh, idea of how Vietnam was before you going there? Do you have any idea of how the country was before you got there? I had done some reading, not extensive. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing I remember paying attention to was even when I was out in California, my mom would send me some clippings out of the Picayune paper down in New Orleans. There was a warrant officer from New Orleans who was in Vietnam and was writing almost like a daily column about what he was doing there. And he mentioned a lot about the culture of Vietnam. He mentioned a lot about the, the terrain because he was flying. He was a, warrant, a pilot, warrant officer pilot. And I picked up a lot of that detail, but it was more, you know, on the, the textbook level rather than the experience level. But I think it was better from him than it would be for me just reading a, you know, a Michelin's guide to Vietnam. But, but that was all I knew about it. Huh? Okay. So when you got there, how was your living conditions? How would you describe them? Well, for GIs, uh, tents, barracks, depending on where you were. Okay. Uh, I can tell you that those in combat units out in the field didn't have the luxury of uh, barracks. They were in tents or in basically bunkers. The, the unit, when I moved out, off of Thompson Oot at Camp Red Ball, we had a shower facility that was in a tent. That was interesting. Uh, the water was heated during the day in old uh, fuel drums, and then you took a shower, and if you got there early enough, you got hot water. If you got there late enough, you got cold water. Uh, the latrines were interesting at best. They were basically 
wooden outhouses with five or six sitting positions, for lack of a better term. And there was no plumbing as such. Basically, it was a 55 gallon drum cut in half, slid under the seat, you did your business. And then you found out later on what, what happened to those. You, you had a barrel burning detail, for lack of a better term. You pull those barrels out, pour diesel fuel on it, light it on fire, and that was a mess. <laughs> That, sure that's, was. <laughs> that was uh, one of the less fond memories you had. And uh, it, it developed all sorts of nicknames. But <laughs> and you know you were in trouble when you got that detail several days in a row. Okay. <laughs> Did you ever get the detail? Yeah. No. Okay. I, I, I never got it several days in a row, so it must have been doing halfway. Okay, good. that's good. <laughs> Well, you was in Vietnam. How were you communicating with your family? Or did you ever communicate with them? By letter. Uh, that was all we had early on. Mm -hmm. My second tour over, they had, and I forgot the name of it. It's a, you could call, and there were ham operators mm -hmm. that would take the call. They'd relay to another ham operator here in the States, and then they'd call your, whoever you're calling. So... It was a, hey mom, over. <laughs> How you doing? Over. <laughs> uh, the first time I listened to one of those, it was a friend of mine called and he called his wife and his wife apparently couldn't hear or didn't understand and he's, it's me, honey, over. Bob, over. Your flaming husband, over. <laughs> and I'm thinking that was an interesting way. <laughs> But most of the time, it was strictly by letter. I uh, bought a tape recorder with the little round tapes. Uh, didn't, the cassettes were just coming in. And I sent a couple of those home, but my parents told me those got kind of messed up in shipment, so it was just letters. Uh, Mom would send me goodie packages routinely. You know, uh, food that we couldn't get there, stuff that she knew I liked, and it was awesome. Uh, you know, you look at it and say, really? But, you know, chocolate chip cookies. You didn't have those in the PX. <laughs> uh, and she'd send canned goods that she knew we, we couldn't get regularly. I don't have any major complaints about the food in Vietnam from the mess hall, except the mess hall had the same problem everyone else did. You got too much of one thing. I remember one time we counted 21 straight days, the only meat we got was hot dogs. Wow. And the cooks had to get very creative. You know, hot dog on a bun, fine. But hot dog omelet, hot dog and fries, hot dog on various vegetables. There's only so many ways you can cook a hot dog. And we had every one of them. Then there was one time roast beef. And I didn't know you could cook roast beef, like Yankee pot roast, Spanish pot roast, plain, plain pot roast, barbecue pot roast, pot roast. <laughs> and I really? One time on that series of pot roasts, got back and we had had a helicopter crash and the remains came to the morgue. We processed them and three of the guys were badly, badly burned. And I don't want to say the human remains burn smell like pot roast, they don't. But when you smell burnt pot roast, it brings up some memories that you really don't want. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. really? Okay, it's time to go break into mom's goodie bag. Mm -hmm. But uh, the cooks, I thought, did an awesome job for what they had. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you have ever heard of, what do they call it in the real world? Chip beef on toast cream beef on toast. Well, in the military, it's SOS, and the polite term would be stuff on a shingle, and they'd serve that. I loved it. Most people couldn't stand it, but I thought it was awesome. It was a, it was a white cream gravy with whatever leftover meat they had, and it, it varied from day to day, but that was a breakfast dish, two fried eggs on it, and if that didn't fill you up, nothing would. But like I said, food wasn't for what they had to deal with, I thought they did fine. 
I was very jealous of not being near an Air Force mess hall because my last part of my tour, I worked the midnight type shift out at the mortuary and we'd go over to the Air Force mess hall for a, a midnight meal. And it was awesome. The, the thing was steak again. And we just gobble it down. Well, we apparently forgot that where we worked, we got a certain odor. And we'd show up at that mess hall and finally the cook came and said, Sarge, you can't keep coming back. You stink. Uh -oh. You call me, tell me what you want, and I'll bring it over to you. I'll get some. And so we got it catered. <laughs> But, that worked out for you. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> so, how long would it, like, I know you say that your mom used to send you, like, goodie bags. How long would it take to get all the way over there? The letters yeah. usually were a week to 10 days. Okay. And I'll be honest, I didn't pay attention to the postmark on the packages, so it's got to be slower than that. Okay. Probably a couple of weeks. Sometimes the cookies were very crumbled and very stale. <laughs> okay, so can you share with me like how was um, your day over there, like your routine while you was okay. over there? The routine changed depending on where we were and the time of year. Okay. Uh, our routine was obviously based on casualties. Hmm. Uh, when I first got there, uh, working out at the mortuary itself, I don't think I got more than four hours of sleep in any one day. Uh, it was just, we didn't have enough people to process the dead. Uh, there were times later on when we sat around twiddling our thumbs. And those were the good days. You know, uh, you could sit there and catch up on mail, catch up on reading. A lot of guys took correspondence courses from the University of Maryland. I don't know how they got involved in it, but they did. Uh, but the routine at first was we just slept there at the morgue and when you, you could catch some sleep you catch it uh, you made sure where you went to sleep and nobody confused you with a body that slammed you on a table at some point but um, once after the may offensive of 68 i gotta say things probably at the personal effects area out at red ball we get up six in the morning eat go to the effects depot. You had a shift all night long for people coming in and processing the stuff in, but that was just checking it in. Uh, we would work from seven to, in the morning to seven in the evening, getting the guys' goods, cleaning them, screening them. There was a whole bunch of restrictions on what we could send to the next of kin. I believe the letter of the regulation was anything that would unnecessarily remind the next of kin of the manner of death. Obviously, anything was going to remind them they're dead, but the manner of death. So we couldn't send home anything that he had on his possession that got damaged or bloody. We would try to clean up as much as possible. The huge debate was if the guy was wearing a, a, a medal, either religious or secular, if it got damaged in his death, but clean, could we send it? Generally, we sent it. Uh, guys had cigarette lighters that had all sorts of stuff on them. Our, if you were in the first infantry division, uh, a lot of them had that as a, the, the emblem of the division. <clears throat> no mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great, duty first. Well, that was the motto of the division. And there was initially a debate with that remind him, well, man, they know he's dead. <clears throat> that got that got to go home. Uh, there was one, uh, when I die, bury me face down so the whole world can kiss my, and we don't need to know the rest of it. Hmm. But they wouldn't let that go because that would remind him. Um, they wouldn't let anything that had supposedly foul language on it. <clears throat> and that covered a multitude of stuff. Some of those cigarette lighters would misquote Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, for I so fear no evil, for I'm the evil of son of a, in the valley. Well, they wouldn't let that go. If it said son of a gun, they'd let it, but son of a, no. Uh, that 
that was one other. I'm dropping, I'm missing it right now, but it was uh, a curse word and they wouldn't let that go. Uh, they wouldn't let pictures go that would show wounded or being treated or whatever. Now, obviously the guy didn't have a picture of himself being treated, but they didn't want to do that. We hit a very sensitive area where you, girlfriends or wives would send pictures. <clears throat> well, that in itself wasn't a problem, but some of them were nude or partially nude. And when you have two or three, like, uh, okay, which one is girlfriend, which one is wife, which one is who, we just held them and didn't send any. And we get inquiries. I sent a picture to my husband. And, you know, how do you handle that? Right back, describe yourself? That's not real good. <laughs> and uh, we did have one, and it was this guy's wife. And he only had pictures of her, but we didn't know that at the time. She sent a picture of herself. So, okay, fine, we can release them. But it, it got to the point where the letters, to screen through those of a guy writing either his wife or his mom about how scared he was that he wasn't going to make it. And then he didn't get that letter sent. Whoa. We screened him some of the time. We, most of the time, if he wrote it, we sent it. Uh, the letters from home were just unbelievable. On the, the terror and some of, mainly of wives. Moms seemed to hold up pretty well. But you know, you're talking if he was 20 below, so was his wife. And there were some pretty tragic letters there that we had to screen through. And I think I remember that more than the blood and gore of the body side of it. Wow. So when you processed the body back then in, um, were you guys sending like the notifications of the person that died letter to like be a letter or how would that? That went go? up through a completely separate chain. Mm -hmm. We provided the information up our chain of command mm -hmm. and somewhere it got back here to the States and somewhere in the States, they would send number one, a telegram, number two, an official notification and after a while, they reversed that. They went in person to tell the next of kin about the death and then forward it with the official telegram. Uh, we would not find out from whoever notified them where they wanted the remains shipped to. And generally, that was a funeral home in their local area. And where did they want his effects shipped to? And quite often those were widely disparate because sometimes parents or wife had had a grave site picked out but had been transferred in the meantime. Uh, and we didn't handle anything other than shipping the body back to either Travis Air Force Base or Dover Air Force Base. Dover's in Delaware, Travis is in California. And basically, if the remains were going to be shipped east of the Mississippi River, the body went to Dover. If it was going to be west of the Mississippi, it went to San to Travis. At those two points, there was a mortuary facility that did the final cleanup, final cosmetic work, dressing the remains in the appropriate uniform, and then making arrangements to fly either on military aircraft or civilian aircraft that body to a city, uh, an airport, near where the next to Ken wanted him buried. There was a program that changed very often on escorting remains. Even if the remain, and most of them, I say most of them, 100% of the time, the human remains of military went home on a military aircraft, a C-141. And there was anywhere from three to a hundred bodies on one of those planes, just depending. They went home in what we call a transfer case. It's, the body is in a box that's about that wide, that deep, and six and a half feet long. And we loaded them in those at the, after, at the mortuary. Basically the process, we get them in, clean them up, ID them, 
we had civilian hired em embalmers that would embalm the remains if they were embalmable. If not, they were treated with various powders and stuff to preserve them as best they could. And we put those in a transfer case, clamp on top, put a flag on the transfer case, put them on a low boy truck and take them over to the Air Force loading area. They would load them on the plane and fly them home. There would be at least one escort on every flight. Generally, it was just a guy going home and they stuck him with that job. <clears throat> if they had a relative of one of the deceased in Vietnam and the family asked for that person to escort, it would be that one. And he or she would be responsible for the entire group. Nothing to that. That's a matter of just being there. Um, when a body got home and got ready to ship from Dover or from Travis, there would be an escort with that soldier or sailor or Marine that would go from Dover to the funeral home. They would usually turn the whole process over to a survivor assistance officer or a survivor assistance NCO that had already met with the family and was going to handle the funeral. Quite often, the family asked the individual who escorted the remains to stay. That got interesting, but it happened. Once the funeral was over, the survivor assistance officer would be available to the family over the next several months, basically could handle insurance, property claims, and whatever else was there. Back in that day, the army and the government insurance was at the beginning of the war was ten thousand dollars. Sometime in there, it went up to fifteen thousand. Uh, that if you died, you got that. If you had private insurance. Most private insurance would not cover war casualty. However, if they died in an automobile wreck in Vietnam, that insurance would pay. So any non-combat death in Vietnam, they did an autopsy to formalize cause of death. And I find that interesting, but it makes sense. Uh, if you know, uh, a next of kin could get an additional 20, 30, 100,000 because it was a non-combat death, Go for it. Okay. A couple of stories of the escorts that were absolutely moving. One, I'm going to share two of them. One was a young man, I can't remember his name right now, but he was an, an 82nd Airborne Trooper. He was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina and got married to a young lady named Maria. Okay. And uh, Maria was originally from San Antonio, Texas, and I cannot remember why she was at Fort Bragg, but she was there. They met, got married, and then he got orders to Vietnam, mm -hmm. went to Vietnam, was killed. He was from a place in Texas, but it wasn't San Antonio. It was south of there. It was a much smaller community. Maria was the primary notification on his death, and his parents were secondary. Well, his parents didn't know anything about him being married. That was kind of, we notified Maria. Maria had left Fort Bragg and went to Pennsylvania, and we couldn't figure out why she was in Pennsylvania. Her call, well, we finally figured out later, she was raised in an orphanage in Pennsylvania, and then moved to Texas afterwards, then went to Fort Bragg. But anyway, Maria wanted his body buried near this place in Pennsylvania. And his mom and dad what do you mean he's going to Pennsylvania? His wife, wife. They knew nothing about Maria. And I'm thinking, oh, this would be fun. I was on this one. <laughs> and uh, Maria said, I've never met them. I said, well, are you going to have any issues if they come to the funeral? No. 
he's their son now. We might not get along, but they need to be here. So I'm okay. Well, they had a very small chapel that was the chapel for the orphanage. And it was run by a group of nuns. I don't remember them, but uh, it was a very tiny chapel. It had a center aisle that once we put the casket at the front, you weren't going to pass the casket. That was it. They had a walkway down each side in the pews room. And Maria was up on, in the sanctuary with two nuns. And she said, you know, I, I feel ridiculous because no one here knows him. No one's going to show up. But she was amazed. A lot of the people who were in the orphanage with her came because she was there. And we knew that his mom and dad were going to show up, and they did. Mom opened the back door, and I, I don't think she did it on purpose. She flung those doors open. Crash. And I looked, and I'm thinking, ooh, she is mad. And she looked down and saw her boy's casket and looked over, and obviously Maria, who at this point is six and a half, seven months pregnant, but mom couldn't see that from where she was. And mom stormed up that aisle. And I'm thinking, man, we're not going to fit past your son, so that's good. And she did what any mom would do. She put her head on that cast and just wailed. And about that time, Maria got up and was walking over. Mama looked and saw Maria, pregnant as pregnant can be. And all the animosity ended. Had his funeral up there, but they decided not to bury him there. Maria went back to Texas with them. The, the longest I tracked is she had the baby, the little boy, the name back for him, back in Texas, and everything except for dad not being around went well. We expected that to be a horror story. What? The other one was a good friend of mine was assigned this transfer for a guy in Nashville, Tennessee. And he had, didn't know him from the man on the moon. He was a highly decorated young guy. He had a row of ribbons that wouldn't quit. And his name, the soldier's name, I'm talking about the escort's name was Jack Cormier. Checked out the body at Dover and got on the plane and flew. The funeral director came out and said, Jack, you know this guy? I don't know. Well, it's kind of odd to send a Marine with an Army escort. He said, no, that's my guy's in the Army. He said, a Marine in uniform on this guy. He looked at, looked at name tag. Oh, my goodness. Somehow at Dover, they switched planes. And there was a guy, in a, the Army guy, supposed to be with a Marine, up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Both funerals were expected within six hours. I said, okay, Jack, how do they handle that? Two Learjets from different places in the military took off. One went to Cincinnati, one to Nashville, picked up the bodies, flew them to the opposite place, and got them both there in time for the film. Wow. <laughs> that was interesting. Very interesting, at least. But they didn't make it on time. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, I guess things happen <laughs> all the time. Uh, I want to share one other that just came to mind. Mm -hmm. This, too, is up in Pennsylvania near the Amish country. Mm -hmm. And this guy was, I don't know what they refer to him as, but he had grown up Amish, and obviously the military was not a place for him, but he ended up in the military. And he informed his parents he was in the military, but he lied. He told them he was a medic. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. He was an infantryman who got killed in Vietnam. And... They sent his body back. The parents had come to grips with the fact that the son was in the military, but they thought he was a medic in a non-combatant role. And they were asking the escort, as he's laying there in the casket, what those various medals were. He was telling them, and there's an award that the infantry has, it's called a combat infantry badge, CIB. And he told them that's the combat infantry from bad, and they could see mom and dad just bristled. Why does he have an infantry badge on him? Well, the escort thought very quickly on his feet and said, because he was a medic in an infantry unit, they awarded him that medal on honor. Well, I forgot the word for it. But 
just because he was in the infantry unit. And they said, oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> and you find out all sorts of things about that. <laughs> sure. Um, so when you went to Vietnam, how oh, in the mortgage or where you were working, did you have like a commanding officer? Or how did they went on that side of the... I had a commanding officer, but I saw him maybe five times the entire time. Okay. He was doing mainly admin stuff. I don't even remember too much about my boss at the mortuary part. His name was Sergeant Duke. He was a huge, and I mean but muscular, huge black man who told me, he said, you do what I tell you, you'll go home alive. You don't do what I tell you, and I can't guarantee it. Said, Thanks, Sarge. Second or third night there, I'm asleep on one of the tables, catching a cat nap, and I remember vaguely when I got there, he said, if you hear the sirens go, it means we're either mortar or rocket, go out that door, count 15 steps and hang a right. You'll run into our bunker. Okay. Well, I came up from a dead sleep during a siren, went out that door, counted my 15 steps and took a left. Oh, no. And I'm looking, I said, that sword lied to me. And all of a sudden, this big hand grabs me by the face, yanks me around, I said, I said, right, stupid. Oh. <laughs> and dragged me back to the bunker. And he never let me forget that. I bumped into him years later in another place. He said, you figure out your left from your right yet? <laughs> The other man I remember, and again, it wasn't the commander, it was my section chief, was a Sergeant Palumbo. And Palumbo was a character of characters. He had been in the Korean War, and I believe I'm remembering the unit in Korea correctly, the 387th Regimental Combat Team. And they had been dropped by the Yalu River in Korea during the war and he was very young, fresh out of training. And he said, you don't have to worry, the Chinese don't have the engineering capabilities to cross the Yalu. So you're fine, we're just here to you know, observe. Okay, well, he woke up the next morning, looked out and he said, he woke his sergeant up and said, sergeant, it's been snowing for 20 something days, why is that ground down there brown? It was the Chinese army crossing the Yalu. Uh, they forgot the Yalu froze two feet thick. They didn't need to worry about engineering capabilities. And he said that was the beginning of one of the biggest routes he'd ever been involved in. He said, I didn't know I could run that far or that fast in that weather. <laughs> but he, he was an unbelievable NCO. He, he would train us. He would treat us well. He worked our butts to the bone, but he was fair. And as long as, as a leader, you're fair, you can do anything. And I didn't have any doubt in my mind that what he asked us to do, he did. And I remember him until, you know, I'm sure he's long dead because he had to have been late 30s at that point. So, yeah, he probably, but I remember Sergeant Palumbo very well. And, uh, I don't want to say he kept me alive, but I'm sure he helped. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Do, um... Did they ever, or did you guys were ever like a target uh, during the war? Oh, how we would got, that be? Camp Red Ball got hit three, four, five times with mortar fire. Only once did they have any kind of ground attack. Okay. And I really believe in my heart of hearts they were hitting the wrong place. They thought we were an intel unit down the road. And they came at us, but they crossed the field. There wasn't a lot of them. And... Um, I just, you know, it was what it was. Uh, we went out and picked them up the next day and turned them over to the South Vietnamese and went about their business. When we got any action at all was when we would go out and what we called SNR, Search and Recovery. And that was often enough that I didn't want to do it, but it wasn't, I, I was not leaving, living like a grunt. I just pounded that stuff day in, day out. We'd go out when a unit was in an action that they have to keep moving and they couldn't locate one who they presumed was dead. So we'd go in later 
do a sweep of the area. And uh, we got hit a couple of times because I think that uh, we were usually a fairly good target. We were still walking around with M14s, which is a, a huge weapon compared to the infantry, which was carrying M16s. They could carry a lot more ammo. We couldn't. Uh, but we got several times. Uh, we have an infantry squad usually as our uh, cover protection. Uh, they would tend to lead the way doing, a, I don't know what they call their maneuver. They were back and forth all over. Which we we'd find them. And once we found a guy, that was it. We 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 helicopter him back to whichever morgue was appropriate, then hangar, Thompson Oop, and wait for the next call. I would suggest of three years I was in Vietnam, I spent maybe a grand total of thirty or forty days in the field, which would I would take any day. Actually, I would prefer not any days in the field, but uh, a, a grunt infantry probably would spend 30 or 40 days not in the field. Mm -hmm. So. Were the, did you ever were injured or gowned during this war or no? I, I got injured in a lot of ways, never by the enemy shooting me or fragments. I got several times that my equipment got hit. I, uh, I, I used to fudge on your Alice pack you'd carry a first aid pack right here. Mm -hmm. Well, I smoked at the time. That's where I kept my cigarettes because that's the highest thing when I'd go through water. Mm -hmm. And I don't want my cigarettes lower where they get wet. Well, I carry my lighter up in there too. And one time, a mortar landed fairly close. I got knocked on my rear end and my shoulder was killing me. Mm -hmm. But what it was, my lighter stopped it. I also, one other time, uh, the guy in front of me tripped off, hit a landmine, tripped it off, and both of my magazine pouches stopped fragments, but nothing hit me. I have had friends of mine trip them, and they look like shredded wheat, but nothing hit them. Uh, I got dropped out of a helicopter one time into the edge of a rice paddy with bamboo and I got my clothes looked like somebody had taken a knife. I just shredded the, the grass was so sharp. Again, a lot of cuts on my arms and legs and stuff, but no, no. The bad guys never shot me. <laughs> and okay. I, well, that's good to hear on my end. Um, what would you say was your biggest challenge of experience during the war? keeping getting up the next morning and doing it again. It just, you know, my, my thought was it's got to end at some point. And admittedly, after the first 30 days, it never got that busy again for any length of time. That was the Tet Offensive. There was a May Offensive of 68 that was for a much shorter time just as intense. And then when you had the individual actions, the, uh, the various uh, highlights, you, I didn't have to work the Hamburger Hill deal. That went to Don Ang. But I know that reading reports, they were just as busy. At time we worked with the downed aircraft, with uh, the Vietnamese company and the, their families on board. It was unbelievably intense and busy for a few days. Uh, there was a... In, I can't remember if it was Tainan or Chu Lai, there was a bomb went off in an army mess hall and there were like 35 killed. Well, we got them all at once. So that was an unbelievably intense two or three days. But basically, day in and day out was I think the same. I don't care what your job was there, getting up, doing it again. Uh, and that was it. So I know you share about the children's on um, date Christmas. So were you guys in charge of in the mortgage of uh, the military personnel and like civilians or how did that win? Any Vietnamese, whether they were military or civilian, we turned over to the Vietnamese Army. 
Okay. And uh, we made arrangements they would come with ambulances and pick up those bodies. Okay. American civilians, we were, we processed. Now, there weren't a lot. Uh, the entire Vietnam War, there were nine military females that died. Seven went through Saigon, two went through Da Nang. Because of the scarcity, they were, that was, people watched very carefully on how they were handled. Of the seven that we processed, three were hostile fire, the others were accidents or injury type deaths. Uh, one was a Red Cross worker. We had, I don't know the total, maybe 12 civilian deaths that were men that were State Department or contractor employees and that, that we just processed just like we did GIs, sent them home. The women, we did the same thing, but they went uh, with special escorts and I, I'm not sure why they were just as dead as the GIs were, but I, I presume back at that time, the military was, there were very few women in the military and they were one or two jobs. They were nurses or they were um, the, the high echelon administrative types. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were just very few. The only women I ever saw in Vietnam other than Vietnamese women were the Red Cross workers would come around uh, and when we go to the hospitals to pick up bodies, the nurses there. Uh, I think the nurses got short shrift. They, those gals worked. They, and it had to be tough on them because number one, they were the only females around. And I'm sure they got hit on more than you could shake a stick at. And, and they played big sister, little sister, a, a number of roles. Uh, but that's basically all I remember of that. Back then in the news, how did the news were back then? Like, were you able like to radio, TV, or how to? Oh, yeah, but that was Armed Forces Vietnam. <laughs> you remember the movie Hello Vietnam? Or you heard that? Mm, I hear about it. Yeah. Uh, Robin Williams starred in that. Mm -hmm. There was a radio announcer in Vietnam, and he was a real guy. Robin Williams played it well. Mm -hmm. Every morning at six o'clock. Forever, morning Vietnam. A friend of mine one time was asleep. He had left his radio working at the foot of his bunk. It went off. He shot his radio. Oh no! I'm amazing. Shoot his foot, but oh no! But that obviously was you know the military making the news. We could pick up on normal radios, broadcast, English broadcasts out of various Far East countries. Mm -hmm. uh, the BBC had a lot because of all the British holdings in Southeast Asia. I don't ever recall picking up a radio station from the US, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's over the, you know, the, um, we had TV there and we get delayed stuff from the states, but I don't ever recall a delayed news broadcast. Mm -hmm. I remember delayed football games, black and white. Mm -hmm. I remember watching LSU and Ole Miss play. The year Archie Manning played for Ole Miss. I remember watching some professional games. Four days later, we knew the score of the Super Bowl, but we finally got to watch it. Those type, but the news, if we got it, it was in uh, papers that are parents or wives sent us, and that was a week old by the time we got it. Mm -hmm. We we demolished, demolished, you know, just eat up on it, but uh, it that's where we picked up, hey, this isn't going as well at home as we thought it was here. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it irritated us, irritated me. Huh? Mm -hmm. I don't speak for everyone else, but. So when it came to the news back then in the conflict that was happening, will you say they were accurate with the news they were giving or were you living or not, not really? I didn't see the same stuff they were okay. reporting. Mm -hmm. I 
you know, I remember Walter Cronkite later on making the announcement that he just couldn't support it anymore. I remember bumping into many newsmen in Vietnam that I would trust as far as I threw them because I believe they were there to make a name for themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't think they intentionally hurt military people, but I think they put a lot of GIs in harm's way. Uh, eventually, they soured on the war, and I understand why. They were in it up to their elbows. GIs were dying by the bucket load for what? The politicians kept switching. What were we there for? What were we there for? I know that a lot of people look back at the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and say, that was fake. Well, I wasn't in the Gulf of Tonkin at the time, so I don't know if those destroyers got hit by PT boats or not. Uh, I know that was the tripwire to send American forces to Vietnam in great numbers. We were already there. Uh, I don't think we learned well from the lessons we should have learned from the French involvement. Had we ever read Bernard Fall's book on uh, war in a very small place, uh, he wrote one about the mobile uh, armored forces in Vietnam. That Had we studied those, we would have never gotten an, our own Khe San, because that was Dien Bien Phu just in South Vietnam. It was the attempt at Dien Bien Phu. But we didn't learn. We thought we could do it on our own. And I don't think we ever trusted the Vietnamese enough to ever win that war. We played Big Brother, which might have been okay for arming, training, but I think we hitched our ride to the wrong horse. And uh, you know, we always wanted to call Ho Chi Minh a communist. Well, he was a communist. But he was also a nationalist who was trying to get the Vietnamese people to unite. And we started out with Diem, and then we ended up supporting his overthrow, which didn't make a lot of sense, because no one after him was strong as he was. But um, yeah, I can understand why the news turned on him. But when you turn on the powers that be, you also turn on the boots on the ground who don't deserve that. And they ended up suffering for it. Okay. How was coming back home? How was home for you when you came back after? The first time I came back was in January or February of 69. Mm -hmm. I came back for a 30 day leave before I went back. I detected a lot of, hmm. I remember my older sister saying, what can I do to help? And she came with some of, bless her heart, the Looney Tunes ideas I've ever heard. But I think she recognized that. She was in college at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think she recognized the fact that on campuses, this war was going downhill fast, if it hadn't already gone. Uh, I didn't see anything overt at the airports, but I do know that when I'd go places, when I was home on leave, you know, you could tell GIs, the GI haircut stood out like a sore thumb, and they knew who we were. And you got a lot of stuff like, do you really believe killing all those kids? I said, no oh, dude, we don't go out to kill kids. Do kids get killed? Yeah, that's called war. And it was the second time back that we ran into literally at the airport, like they were waiting for GIs to come off those buses from Oakland Army Terminal and wherever the other services came to. And that was pretty horrible. I know a lot of guys by that time would show up at the airport, go to the men's room, take the uniforms off and put on whatever civilian clothes they had. The crowd still knew you, you had that short haircut. You probably were walking around in GI shoes because you didn't have any shoes of your own. And uh, it was tough. And 
that's why I said when I, I finally got over that, I think, years later. The only exception to that was in April 1975. I was commissioned at the time. I was at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and that's when Saigon fell. And in the housing area I was in, most of us had been to Vietnam. And it was a very rainy day. And we all got together and sat out on somebody's picnic table and drinking beer to try to forget. Are you kidding me? They surrendered? And uh, then I moved on in my life. I uh, had to, two older kids, went to Germany, came back, went to Fort Sill for the advanced course. That's when Kate came along. Uh, from there, we came back here to Baton Rouge because I went into recruiting here. Uh, ended up going to Korea, coming back, joining the National Guard. But I thought that I had pretty much put Vietnam behind me, got out of the Army, went into teaching, and then 9-11 happened. Now, between me getting out in 9-11, there was a big event that I thought maybe America finally figured it out, and that was the Persian Gulf War. George Sr. got in, did his thing, and got out. He didn't decide to rebuild Iraq. He said, Iraq needs to decide that. His son didn't learn the lesson. And I understand that something had to be done after 9-11. And I think he went to the right place. And that was Afghanistan. But again, we didn't learn a thing from the Russians. Not a thing. They had gone through that. The British had gone through that. And here we were in Afghanistan for how many years? 15? And listening to the guys and gals who come back from that, it's same stuff, different day, different spot. So after... So you say you went teaching. How old, when you went teaching, how old were you or how? When what? You say after that, you 9-11, you decided to leave and went into teaching? I was already teaching now. Okay. I finished my tour in the Guard, how did I do that, 1989. And I was already going to Southeastern for my certification stuff. Okay. And I got a job in 1990 at Walker High School and was teaching out there. I taught mainly at Walker. Uh, I went out to French Settlement for a year and Albany for a year. But um, I was at French Settlement on 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I remember dealing with the kids with that. They were shocked. We got the first word that one of the janitors came in. A little skinny guy, he said, Coach? Some fool done flew an airplane into a building in New York. And I'm thinking, okay, fine, you know, well, small plane or something. And he came back and said, oh, no, coach, there's two of them done hit it. I said, okay, that's an accident. But we started watching it. And, you know, I understand America's reaction. And that, that you know, what did you do? If you hit a military target, that's one thing. The Twin Towers? And I believe that George Bush was right to lash out. But he decided to transfer that to Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein needed to be kicked out of power. Uh, we weren't the ones that needed to do it. Although I'm looking at news now, and some people think he might have been right on the weapons of mass destruction, that he hid them and uh, transferred them to Syria. I picked up on that before in the lives and in snippets, but uh, still, regardless, the politics of how we fought Iraq and Afghanistan was a mirror image of what we did in Vietnam. And we ended up stabbing the ones we sent to fight it in the back. And I, I just have a rough time with politicians. Do you, uh, in and one of the questions that I do have is, did you benefit from the GI Bill? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I used the GI Bill. It expired mm -hmm. right in my last semester at Southeastern, but I used it to get my certification. Okay. I didn't need to use the GI Bill to get my degree 
after I finished the advanced course at Fort Sill in 1979, matter of fact, the day Kate was born, mm -hmm. I started at Cameron University on the what they call the bootstraps program, it's a degree completion. I had taken courses here, there, picked up 50 something, 60 something hours, and I went to Cameron for two summers and a, the two main semesters and got my degree. And uh, got the bootstrap that way so I didn't have to use my GI Bill. Then when I got out of service, my wife said, why don't you go into teaching? I said, what? She said, you've been teaching people your whole life. I said, yeah, I had to kill people and stuff. I said, no, you'll be a good teacher. So I went over there and got my uh, certification in social studies and taught American history, civics, geography, free enterprise. Got world history once, but that was it. And uh, I, I used those platforms to talk to my students about Vietnam, because I could always wiggle that into a history course. That was no problem. I could wiggle it into a geography course. I could wiggle it into civics. How did we manage to fight that war? But, what about joining any veteran groups? Are you part of any veteran group? Of I went to a couple of uh, veterans of foreign wars, but for the most part, those were guys in World War II and Korea. And the guys in World War II didn't understand us at all. And I understand that. The guys in Korea were kind of, eh, you know, that, they got the rug pulled out from under them, but not quite as violently. And it just turned to me to sitting around the table with old men drinking beer, telling lies. <laughs> okay. No. How did you, um, or how did you view, um, or what are your views on the draft doggers, doggers? I'm sorry. I know politically the draft is a dead horse, but I think it's, I think that every one in this country, I don't want to say she's serving the military. That's probably not a good idea. But I think everyone in this country should be required to perform some sort of public service. Does it need to be two years? I don't know. But I, I think that we have enough public service jobs, the military, the, the various things that the Salvation Army and other charitable groups deal with. Uh, I would venture to say the work you're involved in, not necessarily having them as police officers, but doing administrative work in a police department where it would free uniformed officers to be on the streets doing police work. I don't know what the tooth to tail ratio in the police department is, but I got a feeling you got a lot of uniformed cops doing non-cop work and it would be so much better to free them up. I think it would also show the younger generation what police work is really about. It's not all getting out there chasing bad guys. A lot of it's chasing good guys, keep them from going bad. But um, yeah, I don't want to say the Peace Corps, but that was one alternative back when you know, the draft was on was if you went to the Peace Corps, you could satisfy the, the requirement instead of getting drafted. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of public service jobs people could do because the court system in the United States calls it community service. Well, do those jobs. And I, I think that one of our biggest problems today in our politics if we don't have a lot of men and women that have served in the military and they don't have a clue what it's like to do that and they'll send them off not knowing what they're sending them off to. Now we have a handful up there that do. We've got a bunch. We've got uh, that no, but they're not in the leadership stuff. You know, our president, his son was in the military. But I don't think our president understands it very much. Uh, our vice president, I don't know that she has anyone in her immediate family that's been in the military. 
and I would venture to say in Congress of the 537, less than, less than 100 have had any military service. And when you're the folks that are making the call to send people overseas to do this country's business, I think there need to be more of you to know what this country's business looks like. And uh, how, um, or what do you think about United States won or lost the war of Vietnam? Do you think it was a won or a loss? Uh, I've got a stock answer that. We won the thing on the battlefield, but lost it in Congress. Okay. And we, we did. Uh, there was no major engagement during that war, military engagement that we lost. But we lost it back home to the American people, said enough's enough and the politicians pulled back. So on the world stage, we lost it. I don't think there's one of us that came back and said, felt that we lost it militarily. But wars aren't just military, they're political too. Now, it was something you mentioned about the Agent Orange. The Agent Orange, can you explain, uh, share with me a little bit more of that? Agent Orange was used much more in the northern part of South Vietnam okay. and along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, trying to kill the vegetation so our intel could spot enemy movements. I was stationed in Three Corps, which was pretty far south. I operated in Two Corps a lot, and during the Cambodian invasion, that we didn't go into Cambodia, which was a lot, because we went into Cambodia. Agent Orange was used extensively. I have no doubt in my mind I've been exposed to Agent Orange. Uh, but just as much, I have no doubt that I wasn't exposed to enough for me personally to suffer from it. I had a very good friend of mine that was a fellow teacher at Walker High who I know, although it's not been medically said, Agent Orange killed that man. I, he had every symptom, every, but that was, again, Agent Orange wasn't the big boogeyman in the news at that point, so he just got glossed over. And I am sure there are thousands died from Agent Orange. How many get catch it, I don't know. I know many a time when I'd be back showering, uh, the water running down the drain was orange. And it's not like I used orange spray paint to, to hide myself. So mm -hmm. just that stuff in the gear. So what what are your thoughts about the um, domino theory today? Say the what? The domino theory today. I'm missing what you're asking me. Yeah. Uh, the question is, what do you think about the domino theory? The domino theory? Yeah. It was true. The domino theory was developed that when China went communist, mm -hmm. China would not in and of itself directly invade countries, but would stir communist type elements. Ho Chi Minh. I think the Vietnamese hate the Chinese, but they took their arms and ammo to use it for their national purposes. You look after China went communist in 1947-48-49. The first biggie after that was Korea. China didn't overtly you know, take over North Korea, but North Korea would not have survived without them. North Vietnam was not taken over by China but would not have survived without them. The communist guerrillas in Laos and Malaysia were supported totally by China. Some Russian involvement, but mainly China. That was the domino theory. And if you look, the only part that's really held is South Korea. And that's mainly because the United Nations supported South Korea. Not just the U.S., although the U.S. is the biggest supporter. Vietnam fell. Laos, eh. 
Thailand has managed to, to hang on. I'm amazed at that. Malaysia, tough. I don't know what Burma's current name is. It's no longer Burma, but it's fallen. And the ones I heard that supported American action in Vietnam primarily because they feared the domino theory were the Australians. The Aussies were not a powerful enough army to hold them on their own. But the Aussies sent to Vietnam a group of men and women and units that had America percentage-wise sent, we'd have had about a million and a half troops in Vietnam. They sent well over half their army there. And when you listen to them, they had the legitimate fear. They've seen domino theories before that started back with the Japanese in World War II, the domino theory. Beat Japan. And they welcomed us back with open arms. Matter of fact, I took an R&R &R, from rest of the crew to Australia. It was a ball. The Aussies didn't have to spend a dime in Australia. <laughs> they treated you well. Well, based on all um, you had went through, do you, if you will, or oh, you have the chance to go back, will you serve again the country or will you? If I was the same age, I'd go back. I have absolute zero interest to go back and visit Vietnam. Mm -hmm. A lot of veterans are going back and I'm really? But I have absolutely no compunction about what I did. I believe I did what was right. I believe my country bailed too soon. And I regret that they did that. But that's calls on them. And it, I'm not talking Democrats or Republicans. He, he, Lyndon Johnson went crazy. Nixon, yeah, he got us out by, okay, we'll Vietnamize the war, but then we didn't give them enough to do it with. Have you ever seen a Vietnamese soldier walking around in American gear? You know, the average Vietnamese soldier might be five feet tall, and we're putting them in gear that's divine for six foot tall soldier. We're, we're handing them equipment that just doesn't make a lot of sense. And we expected them to use our tactics against a main force unit, and they were fighting guerrillas. They were going to fight guerrillas the rest of the war. And everybody said, yeah, but the North Vietnamese used tanks at the end. Only because they could. They didn't need to. Yeah, uh, I have no no regrets for what I did. I am proud of what I did. I just wish that we had ended it differently. Okay. Have you ever visited the Vietnam Memorial at Washington? Yeah. Been there a few times. And uh, I went there once and took a group from Walker High there. And uh, I had to just sit there for a while on my own. I couldn't move on. I just I don't know personally that many people on the wall, but those names just come off of memory that, yeah, that, that was 1968, that group was 1969. Yeah. And it just, I bawled like a baby the first time I was there. And she was with me and she had to, she had to take care of me the rest of that, that day and night. And the, um, one of the trips wasn't just the wall. We've got the Vietnam Memorial with the three soldiers. I have not been back since they had the Nurses Memorial. They built that one since I've seen it. And I have absolutely no intention of traveling again. So I won't see that other than in video and stuff. Uh, I, I presume that each group, I was stunned the Vietnam Memorial was built before the Korean Memorial, and it was also built before the World War II Memorial. Okay. I've seen the Korean Memorial. That was there before I quit making trips. The World War II, again, I've only seen, just like I've seen the nurses on video and stuff. And I'm, man, wow. The last trip we went was the spring of 2001. And, uh, 
course, 9-11 occurred a few months after that, so the security was horrendous. And I don't think, I don't think you could even take tours of the White House for 10 or 12 years after that. I might be wrong, but a whole bunch of stuff got shut down. I understand. But uh, you know, the memorial is a very special place. I remember the, there was a huge outcry over it. And you know, as memorials go, that's pretty different. Uh, and I remember people saying there was a scar on the mall. Well, if, if you look from above, it probably looks like a scar. But it just is overwhelming with 58,000 names on it. And there's no way you could sit there and read them. Uh, I've been up there and I, you know, stunned and watching you know, grown men just leaning up against it. And, and I know they're reliving what they went through. And it's tough. What does um, Veterans Day and Memorial Day means to you? I, I get stunned at how many people get that one messed up. Mm -hmm. Veterans Day for anybody who ever served in the military, regardless, during peacetime, wartime, in between. And that's a thanks for your service. Memorial Day is for, a, I don't want to say a select few, there's a whole bunch, those who died. And somehow or another on Memorial Day, we're going around, thank you for your service. Well, I appreciate that, but this ain't my day. My day is in November. Uh, today's the day for those guys and gals who came back feet first, who paid the ultimate thing. And there's nothing we can ever do that's sufficient to thank them other than thank them, think about them, and now transfer that thought to the folks here they left behind. I cannot, you know, I, I've watched moms and dads who lost their son. I've watched wives who've lost their husband. I've watched kids who've lost their dad. For the most part, when I watched a kid who lost their dad, the kid was too young to really understand what was going on. But a 20-year-old wife realizing that the life she was looking forward to with her husband it ain't gonna happen. And she turned around and she's got this kid uh, watching Maria that time, pregnant as pregnant can be, and wondering what's going through that gal's soul right now. I, at, back in those days, you couldn't tell whether you had a boy or a girl until the baby was born. And she notified people that she had that little boy. And eventually word got back to us and it was awesome. But it's tough. If you could change anything about war, what will it be? If you could change anything. What, what would it be? If you could change anything about the war, what would it be? Have the people send us there go a set of balls and finish it. Not just, oh my goodness, politically we're in deep trouble, quit. And I think that's just been our biggest problem since World War II. We have backed away. I don't know that George Bush Sr. was that great a military man, but he was smart enough to get in, win the dead blame thing, and bring the guys home. Uh, you know, we talked the same number of troops on the ground, in the air, and sea in Desert Storm that we had in Vietnam. Now, granted, they were there six to eight months in prep and one month in the war and several months getting out of there. But he did it with less than a couple of hundred dead. And I, uh, those are the types that we have to imitate. We have a powerful enough military to go in and kick anybody's rear end that we want to. But we have to have the gumption to do it. We have to put the authority and the commanders on the ground to do it and then let them do it. And when you get your political aim done, come home. And I believe Bush Sr. did that. I don't think anybody else in my lifetime has because I was born just after World War II ended. And Korea, we didn't. Vietnam, we didn't. Uh, Desert Storm, we did. And at Iraq and Afghanistan, nope, not close. 
in your in your opinion, what should we teach our children um, today about Vietnam? The truth. Mm -hmm. Tell them. And this is any war. I think we have sheltered our kids a lot. And I realize that a you know, five or six year old doesn't need to see blood and gore. But I think teenagers can handle that. And to let them know that, you know, war isn't fun. War isn't a game. It's not like you did as a kid. We go out, bang, 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 and then you, know, you get up and go eat dinner. Uh, when you go bang, 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 somebody ain't getting dinner that day. Uh, or somebody's eating it with a plastic fork at a hospital because you can't pick anything else up. I think we need to tell them the truth about what war is. We, but more than that, we need to tell them the truth about what the politics that gets us in there is and how our system is not designed for the Congress of the United States to wage war. I agree wholeheartedly with the fact that Congress should declare war. And Congress hid behind the Tonkin Gulf Resolution to go to Vietnam. Somewhere, once the resolution passed and we were committed, they should have declared war or got us out, one of the two. I'm, I don't think Desert Storm had a declaration of war. I think that was a resolution. Afghanistan, Iraq, all the same thing, continuing resolutions to fight a non-war. Well, baloney. <laughs> war. And we need our politicians to stand up, and if they're going to commit our youth to war, say so. And then back it up. And get hands off. Let the military run it. Any books or movies or shows that you would recommend that uh, will be more the reality of what really happened back then? Most of the movies I've seen on Vietnam are garbage. Mm -hmm. They're good movies. They're, they're exciting. They're action-packed, but they're not true. Mm -hmm. The one movie that I've seen that I think was the closest to Ben is We Were Soldiers Once and Young. And that was the one Mel Gibson... played Hal Moore. Hal Moore was probably the epitome of a field grade officer that led his men to war. He made a speech before they left Fort Benning that he said, we're going to go to war and not all of you are going to come back alive, but I guarantee you all of you will come back. I will not leave you on the battlefield. I will be the first boot on the ground and I will be the last boot to leave it. And the video, the, the motion picture showed that. The helicopter going into the LZ, he put his boot out and he was the first one to touch. Now he wasn't the first one to be shooting, but he was the first one to touch. And it showed him the last one out. It showed the horror of that war, I think, as well as a video can. And what I think it did that was different from most of the others it showed it from the North Vietnamese Army's side, too. It went inside a North Vietnamese general's mind, his mindset. It dealt with a lot of individual North Vietnamese soldiers, along with a lot of individual American soldiers. It also dealt with an American press corps, and it showed how absolutely ridiculous the bulk of Mar won. And he was co-author with Moore, and I can't remember his name but he was a co-author of the book with Hal Moore, and it showed his actions. The other part that it showed that very few touch base realistically was the wives at home. And it was the Battle of Iadrang, which that movie was about, that I've never heard for sure, but it seemed to be the catalyst to change how the military notified folks at home with the battle deaths. Before, yellow cab sent, was sent with a telegram. Ring the doorbell, here. And the cab driver knew what he was doing. And he was just horrified. Well, Hal Moore's wife intercepted him. Said, don't deliver another telegram. Bring them to me. I'll deliver them. And eventually it got where it changed, where he sent a military officer and chaplain. And that took a lot of doing because when he talked the number who died in certain periods of time. 
he had drank was in late 65, so Ted hadn't come around for another two years. And I can't imagine the number of notifications that went out because we were losing 2,000 a week. Wow. And so it was 2,000 a week going out. But we were soldiers once, absolutely awesome. Books about Vietnam, but not about the American involvement, were we, uh, hell in a very small place. That was about the French deal at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, which basically drove the French out. And the other one was something like the Battle on the Narrow Road, and it was about the French Army's mobile group. And matter of fact, that was the opening scene of the movie We Were Soldiers once. It went back to that Frenchman because the Vietnamese general in the Vietnam War was a lieutenant or a captain in that battle with the French back in the early 50s. And that's it. I, I've seen uh, Hamburger Hill, a lot of good shots, but nah. Uh, Platoon, uh, Apocalypse Now, uh, the one where Emory was, what was that? Uh, oh, he played a great role as a drill sergeant, but it was just it was Hollywood. And they Hollywooded the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. So when did you all retire? Oh, when did you left? 1989 was my last year of military okay. service. I enlisted in 66. I got out of the regular army in 84, went into the guard in 86, and finished in 89. Okay. I was in what? the, in between those, I, there's a deal, the individual ready reserve, which is nothing, you're on a roll somewhere in St. Louis, I guess. Okay, what was the ring? When or what is the rain that you have after leaving the military? What did I miss most? No, rain. Was you a sergeant, corporal? I went in, uh, obviously as a private. Mm -hmm. I got to Vietnam as a private first class. Mm -hmm. Got three promotions there. I left Vietnam as a staff sergeant. Went to officer candidate school, came out second lieutenant. And during that time, the highest rank I had on active duty was captain. Okay. Uh, in the individual ready reserve, I, I never wore them, but I got promoted to major, and I don't really know if I ever got called back where I'd be a major or a captain or what. <laughs> but. Okay, okay. And how how has been life since you live in the army? How you left everything behind? Do you still have any real? I, Flashback or anything that I, bothers I miss the military in a lot of times. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, Facebook drums up a whole bunch of memories. Mm -hmm. Things that absolutely, I don't want to say tear me up, but it, to me, the, the annual Army Navy football game, when the Corps of Cadets comes on, the Corps of Midshipmen, that to me is an unbelievable thing because that's, I, I realize not all of them are there, but each of those academies has 4,400 students. That means 8,800 who have committed themselves to the service of this nation. Mm -hmm. Are they all 100% patriots? I don't know. But they're willing to go through that stuff to do it. And I'm thinking, that's, some, that's the cream of the crop of our young. Because most people don't know what they're committing to. They're not sure what they're committing to because they don't know, especially when they show up as a freshman, what's the world going to be like when I graduate as a senior? Mm -hmm. And I just admire the heck out of them for what they do. Mm -hmm. Most of the other stuff is veteran postings on Facebook that some of them just kind of, wow, and you know, stirs up memories. Some good, some not so good. But uh, I, I think back to some of the non-war stuff. Uh, I spent three years in Germany. Uh, got to command an artillery battery over there. And working with the young men of that unit was fascinating. I remember a driver of mine, his name was Mark Mundy. Mm -hmm. He was a kid out of North Carolina that came up with some of the wildest things I've ever heard. He, uh, he, uh, we were doing a nuclear drill and ended up in our full gear for nuclear protection for almost 24 hours. Now, the only thing you could eat during that time is drink because you could have got a 
tube that can come out of your mask and you can suck on water or whatever you have in your canteen. And we got a general came along. General Nutting was a commander of the armored division. And he happened to happen by, he didn't happen looking for us. And he told uh, Monday, he said, Special, pull that mask off. I need to talk to you. And I don't want to hear mumbling. And so he pulled the mask off, face as red as can be, sweating bullets. And the general said, what did you think of this? He said, General, I'd like to shoot the son of a gun who ordered this. He said, I'm glad I didn't hand you a pistol because I'm the son of a gun. <laughs> he said, Specialist, I asked, you told me. <laughs> and that was funny. Uh, Mark Mundy also got arrested by the German police. Detained, I don't want to say arrested. He had gotten drunk in Frankfurt and went to the bathroom on some of their rose bushes in the park. And the Germans turned him over to the MPs, the MPs sent him back to us. And I didn't think much about it, you know, I said, okay. Uh, the official charge was urinating in public. I bought it out, give him an Article 15 and restrict him. I'm not going to give him heavy duty for 30 days. So I restricted him for a month to the barracks and uh, that was it. Well, I got this notice coming down through channels that the German government wanted to know what we did. It said Article 15, 30 days restriction. Well, it never got back to the German government. Some clerk up on the American side said, they're not going to be happy with that. I said, I don't care if they're happy with that. He said, well, we're not happy with that. I said, and who are you? That was some spec four up in Army headquarters. I said, well, you're going to have to be happy with it because I can't do anything else. That's called uh, double jeopardy. So well, you better do something, Captain. I said, wait a minute. Are you a spec four? He said, yeah. Put your captain on the line. I I'm doing this on my own. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll send you another report in a few days. So I wrote, we executed Specialist Monday and gave a date by firing squad and sent it up to him. And he called, he said, what do you mean you executed him? So he said, you wanted something bigger? I did. He said, Captain, please don't tell me you executed that boy. I said, you told me I had to do something serious. He said, we haven't executed somebody in the 8th Army since immediately after World War II. I said, well, we have now. He said, put it on your paper, put it in the file, and leave it alone. And I could just hear him. He said, uh, uh, I said, we didn't kill the kid. Just put the file away and be happy. <laughs> Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Going out in the German countryside when we would do reconnaissance for possible wartime positions if we ever went to war. Uh, I remember one time stopping at a German guest house and that's just a small hotel out in the middle of nowhere that probably we call it a what, Airbnb now, they rent out rooms and uh, the husband would take care of the building and the wife would prepare meals. Well, this one, the husband spoke impeccable English, his wife very little, but we sat there and ordered food. There was three of us and our drivers. And one guy ordered habahanchen, which is half a chicken. And she said, no. And we couldn't figure out why not. Well, she wasn't going to cook half the chicken. She was going to go out and kill the chicken. But she wanted both halves served. So <laughs> finally, one of the drivers knew enough German to understand what she was saying. So we ordered the other half. She was happy as can be. And we see her outside in the back. Whoop! <laughs> Broke that chicken's neck, cooked it, and it was the best chicken we've ever eaten. Mm -hmm. Things like that that are neat. Mm -hmm. And how old are you now? Now? Mm -hmm. 76. Okay, good. In a few months, I'll be 77. Okay. Matter of fact, right after Lucy's birthday. <laughs> okay, yeah, then it's not, a few months is not that long anymore. It's on August, huh? August. Okay. Okay. Well, I do want to thank you for your time. Thanks for having me here today well, and sharing uh, information with me. And I'm sure whoever watched your video, um, they're going to thank for your service. As I thank you for your service and what you did and you went through. Uh, probably we cannot imagine, um, you know, what you did in your work because we were not there. And even if we wanted to understand it, we won't be able to because we wasn't there. But I do, I'm sure um, 
every person in the United States does uh, thank you and for your service and everything that you went through for us to be here today. Well, so I really you. want to thank you and thank you for having me in your house. It's a pleasure. Oh, <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you.